We are just continuing our program and then I now have the honor to invite to the stage um, Brian Moss, a very well-known aquatic ecologist, uh, someone with always very inspiring ideas and also with a very long record of publish, publishing about eutrophication. And um, I really uh, am very happy he's here. So still working in Liverpool, he just told me, uh, very active as ever. And um, I just give him the floor. Thank you, Jess. This is a painting by an English artist, Lawrence Lowry, and he would have been horrified to see it projected in the wrong proportions, but we can't change the projector, it appears, so everything is going to be short and squat. But it, it was, he painted in the industrial north of England, where I was born and brought up. And so this sort of introduction to aquatic ecology was what I uh, first saw, because Lowry's uh, canvas, uh, was this sort of grimy, grey, industrial town. I was born, in fact, just quite under this railway viaduct. Uh, but that grimy, industrial uh, nature meant that when I first became introduced to uh, other lakes and the poetry associated with other lakes, I understood very well what the poet, in this case, W.B. Yeats, was saying. He said, I will arise and go now for always, night and day, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey. I hear it in the heart's deep core. And I understood that very well. And I started to understand that poetry, in fact, is the best words in the best order for conveying things. Uh, and then moving on to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, you have in his poem in the Song of Hiawatha, you have a wonderful evocation of leadership in an environmental context. So poetry can be political as well. I have given you streams to fish in. I have given you bear and bison. I have given you roe and reindeer. I have given you brant and beaver. Fill the marshes full of wildfowl. Fill the rivers full of fishes. Why then are you not contented? Why then will you hunt each other? So poetry is the best words, and it can also be used powerfully. So I was really quite pleased when I sent in my abstract for this meeting, and I thought I would write it in rhyme, and that just came as an inspiration. And then I saw it as part of the publicity. Uh, and I was really quite pleased with that. Uh, but what it also means is I will be the first person you have ever heard who will actually keep to his abstract in giving the actual talk. From the Arctic to the equator, from the hilltops to the sea, the temperature is rising. Well, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the uh, uh, IPCC uh, data on global average temperature, on its influence on sea level, on the melting of the uh, Arctic ice, the visual evidence uh, of the melting of the glaciers, mean there is really, there is no doubt whatever that this process is going on. And not only that, and the nutrients flow free. These are uh, diagrams of the uh, uh, UK situation, but the situation in the Netherlands is much the same. Uh, the pristine sorts of level of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, for our waters, uh, judged from undisturbed catchments in similar climatic regions in North America, you would have between 0.1 and 0.2 milligrams of total N per litre. You would have between 10 and 17 micrograms of total phosphorus per litre. What we have are orders of magnitudes, even after restoration, orders of magnitudes higher uh, values than that. And these things for nitrate, not total nitrate, but just nitrate here and total phosphorus here, the red and the yellow and the green are about uh, two orders of magnitude above those pristine standards. So certainly the nutrients are flowing free. Well, staying with those uh, nutrients, uh, the early history of limnology uh, was very much uh, concerned with both nitrogen and phosphorus. You look at the early papers, and they're talking about those as drivers of eutrophication. But with the rise in phosphate detergents in the 1960s and assertions by the detergent industry that phosphorus was not responsible because uh, when you had algal blooms, you couldn't detect any phosphorus in the water. Well, of course you couldn't. It was all in the algal blooms. Uh, then that gave rise to classic experiments in the Canadian Shield, which showed very nicely 
experiments, for example, like this one by David Schindler, uh, took a lake, split it in two, added phosphorus to one half, uh, and got an algal bloom and didn't in the other. And that gave rise to this idea that phosphorus was the driver uh, of uh, nutrient problems uh, the world over. But of course, those lakes were in a very interesting uh, oligotrophic, igneous rock area uh, where uh, nitrogen uh, was uh, provided, uh, but phosphorus was even scarcer. But it, it, it conditioned our thinking. If you look at lowland regions, like, for example, parts of the UK and parts of the, uh, the Netherlands, uh, and particularly the tropics, where you don't have these igneous rock areas, then things may be a bit different, because denitrification rates uh, are relatively high, especially as you uh, increase temperatures. Uh, and when you do bioassays from these sorts of areas, here's one for uh, Lake Titicaca, for example, in the Andes, uh, you often get stimulation by nitrogen. Uh, and if you then uh, look at the uh, overall data, as James Elsa has done, uh, looking at bioassays, uh, uh, thousands of bioassays done in fresh waters in the land and in the sea, then you start to realize that actually phosphorus is not the main driver everywhere. Mostly the drivers are a combination of both nitrogen and phosphorus, and that you get as much stimulus, looking at this meta-analysis, by nitrogen as you do for phosphorus. And perhaps we are going to have to change our attitudes and start, stop thinking entirely in terms of phosphorus and start thinking in terms of both of these nutrients. The evidence is accumulating of the importance of nitrogen. Eric showed this slide. Uh, the uh, uh, submerged uh, uh, macrophyte coverage of Danish lakes dropping very markedly uh, uh, below, above about one uh, milligram of total nitrogen per litre, uh, and to get lots of macrophytes you need both low phosphorus and low nitrogen. Uh, in other contexts, uh, and looking at another aspect of nutrients, uh, we have shown that the biodiversity, the species richness uh, of submerged aquatic plant communities uh, is uh, much higher the lower the nitrogen is, and again, below about one, maybe two milligrams of nitrogen uh, is where you get the highest biodiversities. And then when we have uh, uh, sought to confirm that with experimental systems using experimental ponds, uh, where we added a graded series of nitrogen against a background of about 50 micrograms of total P, a rather typical sort of lowland level now, uh, then what we found, yes, uh, plankton chlorophyll A was stimulated by uh, nitrogen, so was periphyton chlorophyll A, so were the filamentous algae. Uh, the total macrophyte crop was decreased as you increased the nitrogen, uh, uh, but among the species of that crop, certain species were more sensitive than others, and particularly the chirophytes, chira hespida, uh, chira intermedia, and also Elodea canadensis, uh, were influenced much more than uh, some of the other species. So it's becoming quite clear uh, that nitrogen does have major effects. Uh, if I just show you the, the graph of the total macrophyte biomass in relation to those uh, four levels, one milligram, two milligram, five milligrams, 10 milligrams of nitrate nitrogen, then you see the one milligram, the macrophyte soaring up here over a two-year experiment, uh, the uh, other levels giving you much less macrophyte growth. And then when you look at the rate of species loss, starting with a mixed community uh, of macrophytes at the start, and then follow what happens as they outcompete one another uh, and come to some sort of equilibrium, then uh, here at the top is the uh, 10 milligrams, then the 5, then the 2, and then the 1. At the 1 milligram, you have a steady state, but in all of the others, you have a steadily, steady decline in species richness. And then if you plot the rate of decline, the uh, rate regression uh, uh, slope uh, against the uh, nitrogen level, then you get something like this. Uh, up here you have the rate of species loss against the nitrate uh, concentration or loading. You get a graph like this, which fits all sorts of uh, curves, but particularly a michaelis monton curve. And from that you can calculate what sort of nitrogen level you need for no loss of species. And again, it comes out at about 1.75 milligrams of nitrogen per litre. And so that's the sort of level uh, I think that uh, uh, we, we need to be uh, aiming for 
if we are to do something about uh, nitrogen as a eutrophication problem. Well, I was asked to say something about nitrogen, and so that I said, let me now return uh, to the, the, the overall theme of climate change and, and eutrophication. The second verse of my abstract went, where now the blooms are modest and the water plants still thrive, great floating mats may flourish and the fish stocks take a dive. Well, the reason for that stanza are experiments done in my experimental pond system. I'm an experimentalist, uh, and I like doing experiments, and I'm better at that than taking great amounts of data. Uh, our experimental pond system uh, allows us to warm up three meter cubed mesocosms uh, of aquatic systems. There is a, a hot water system pumped through these pipes here. We can alter whatever we like uh, in the sediment. We put in a... Uh, uh, groundwater, uh, very high quality water supply which we can then modify uh, and then we can establish uh, in the systems uh, an aquatic system that has not only a natural water uh, with its bacteria, we put in phytoplankton inocula, there are zooplankton there, uh, there are periphyton and filamentous algae, uh, there are invertebrates, there are plants, there are a bunch of sort of uh, apes that uh, operate the whole system in the middle here and we can put in fish. And the fish we use for this system uh, are uh, three-spined sticklebacks, gasterosteus, uh, culeatus, and there's a very good reason uh, for using uh, sticklebacks. The first of the reasons uh, is that it's an interesting fish uh, in its life history uh, because the male constructs a nest. Uh, he attracts a female down to it, uh, a gravid female. Uh, if she is willing to mate, uh, then she enters the nest, lays her eggs, the male then moves into the nest, puts in the sperm, chases the female away, and then it is the male who looks after the uh, eggs and the young uh, in their earlier stages. So you actually have a complex behavioral cycle uh, that you can use as a measure of things like uh, of pollutants or temperature uh, uh, on the sublethal effects uh, as well as the potentially lethal effects. So sticklebacks, uh, useful uh, for that, but also useful uh, because they are very tough fish. Uh, if I line up uh, some of the major charismatic British fish species, uh, just as uh, a few examples, salmon, brown trout, pike perch, roach, stickleback comes very high up the list in terms of temperature for optimum growth, in terms of temperature for spawning, and in terms of uh, tolerance of low oxygen concentrations. Only tench and the introduced bad guy, the common carp, uh, are more tolerant. So basically what it amounts to, if something nasty happens with environmental change to sticklebacks, something even nastier is going to happen to most of the lowland uh, fish community. So uh, let's talk about the experiment. The first experiment we did was in 1998 to 2000, quite a long time ago now, uh, and in this experiment uh, we uh, changed the temperature, we changed the nutrients, uh, and we had plus or minus fish. Um, the, we gave a three degree rise in temperature, which at the time was thought to be outrageously high uh, as a potential global warming. That's no longer the case. It looks now like an underestimate. But we used three degrees. Uh, we used very modest nutrient levels. We didn't add any nutrients, uh, or we added uh, doses of half a milligram uh, per, per liter of nitrogen uh, and uh, uh, either uh, and 0.05 milligram, 50 micrograms of phosphorus. So it was a very low fertility system, uh, and the sediment was very low in organic matter too. The community of plants included uh, some native ones, elodea. Well, it's actually not native. It's a long time introduced, uh, but has become naturalized. Uh, Potamogeton natans, which is native. Lemna minor, which is native and Lagerosiphon major, which is a South African warm water introduction. And what we found, just to summarize this entire experiment, uh, were moderate effects of warming and nutrients together. Uh, we found that warming increased the growth rate of the plants. Uh, it led to a dominance, whoops, it led to a dominance uh, of uh, uh, Lagrosiphon, the introduced species. Uh, it didn't uh, remove the macrophyte community. Uh, there was no switch to phytoplankton dominance, which we had thought might happen. And there was very little change in the phytoplankton community. There were no 
huge growths of cyanobacteria. I counted 3,200 phytoplankton samples, something I am never, ever going to do again to find that there was virtually no change uh, with warming. Uh, there was a greater incidence of severe deoxygenation uh, and some fish kills. And overall, we concluded that this three-degree warming with this very modest uh, level of eutrophication uh, would uh, produced more symptoms of eutrophication. There was more phosphorus came out of the sediment. Uh, there were some uh, more fish kills, uh, but it was fairly modest. Well, after having done that experiment, uh, we uh, then tried to raise money for another experiment, which is also always difficult. In the interim, then the global warming uh, information had consolidated, and by 2008, uh, our chief scientist uh, for the environment uh, Robert Watson was, was warning our government to prepare for a four degree rise in temperature by the middle of this century. And fortunately, we had anticipated our chief scientific advisor and done an experiment between 2005 and 2007, uh, which put in a four degree rise in temperature. Uh, again, uh, we had uh, temperature uh, treatment and nutrient treatments and plus or minus sicklebacks. Uh, but this time, we simulated better the state of eutrophication of lowland communities in places like the UK and the Netherlands. Uh, we had a, a zero nitrogen treatment, uh, 0.25 milligrams per litre, and 2.5. We had a background uh, of 50 micrograms uh, of phosphorus throughout again. And our sediment we made a bit more organic, uh, still well within environmental uh, reality, but we made it 8% rather than 2%. And our aquatic plant community, this time was a naturally colonizing one, came in from the uh, invertebrates that we put in to start the system uh, with a whole range of about 12 uh, species to, to start with, including Ceratophila, Melodea, uh, two species of Lemna, three species of Potamogetans, uh, and Spirodera polyriza. Well, what happened? Um, well, here's our uh, experimental setup. Uh, ambient temperature versus four degrees, fish and no fish, and these three levels of uh, eutrophication, everything replicated uh, four times. So you're dealing with 48 ponds, uh, which is quite a large amount of work, I can tell you. Well, the best way, enormous amounts of, of data come out of these experiments, so uh, the best way of handling it is to look at it to start with uh, visually. And here you just have photographs of the edge of one replicate of the 12 treatments. Um, and as you work from this side to this side, C is control, F is with fish, H is heating, HF is heating and fish. So going from there to there, you're working uh, in the heat gradient. And working down the diagram, uh, you're working from uh, no nutrients added, the uh, moderate level of nutrients added, and the slightly higher level of nutrients added. And what I hope you can see, although when you do these photographs, you're mostly photographing sky, um, is that as you move across and down the diagram, you've got an increasing dominance of lemna uh, and lemnids, of floating plants. And when you look at the data, then that's borne out. Uh, the effect of temperature was to uh, have very little effect on the submerged plant community, the green, uh, not significant, but on the floating plant community, there was a major increase. And then when you look at the effects of nutrients in this block design experiment, then nutrients tended to decrease the submerged community significantly, whilst at the same time also increasing the uh, floating plant community. So our systems are staying with uh, aquatic plants, but moving more towards uh, floating plants. Well, that has then lots of consequences, and temperature alone has consequences, one of which is for the oxygen status of the system. Here you have just some sample, uh, whoops, uh, some sample uh, uh, diurnal oxygen curves. Uh, blue is the unheated, uh, red is the heated, and you see the familiar rise in the daytime with photosynthesis drop at night, but you notice immediately that the heater tanks have much lower oxygen and the oxygen levels drop to zero uh, by, the, by dawn uh, in many of the replicates. Uh, the difference is not just the physical effect of dissolution of oxygen, uh, th they are much greater. There is a biological uh, component as well. Well, so our heater tanks are uh, dropping in oxygen, and the consequences of that 
uh, are seen in many aspects. First of all, on the invertebrates, uh, here you have, uh, these are the bottom and the plant-associated invertebrates rather than the zooplankton. Uh, if you look at corexids and notonexids, two uh, groups of uh, predatory bugs, uh, heating the shaded uh, histogram always decreases uh, the, uh, the uh, numbers of the biomass and the numbers of corexids and notonectids. But for odonates, the dragonflies and damsonflies, which are actually a tropical, have their center of distribution in the tropics, then odonates uh, tend to increase with heating. But overall, when you divide your invertebrates into predators and uh, uh, prey, uh, then what you find is that uh, as you heat and reduce the oxygen concentrations, then the biomass of your predators uh, is low. Uh, at the ambient temperatures, uh, with higher oxygen concentrations, the biomass of your predators is high. So you're starting to get, among the invertebrate community, a major change in uh, functional groups. Predators decline uh, as you warm and as your oxygen uh, decreases. But that's not the only effect on the animals. Most people are always interested in the fish. Well, while we were doing this big experiment, we were also doing experiments in aquaria, in a sort of five-star hotel for sticklebacks here, uh, where each male had his own individual room, um, uh, nicely uh, warmed at whatever temperature we, we wanted it to be, um, and with video cameras to, uh, to watch what he was doing, and he was given materials to make a nest, and then we gave him a sort of call girl stickleback uh, who was introduced into the tank, and we filmed the behavior of, of what happened. Uh, well, what happened uh, was that as we increased the temperature, from around uh, 1617 up to 21 or so, the, uh, roughly the four degree rise, uh, then the uh, proportion uh, of males building nests decreased. The, of those that built nests, the number of days that they spent tending the nests, fanning the nests to bring oxygenated water close to the eggs and, uh, and, and then the young decreased from to, to virtually nothing over the four degrees and so the percentage of successful incubations of first-generation young drops to very low levels with increasing temperature. It was almost as if the males, when it got hot, sort of said, oh, bugger the kids, uh, we'll leave them and we'll go off down to the pub or something, and the kids were left to look after themselves and, of course, didn't survive. So there, was, there were sublethal effects on reproduction uh, that we were aware of from this experiment. Well, this experiment was done in as I said, five-star hotel tanks with lots of oxygen for the fish. What happens in the main mesocosm tanks uh, outside uh, where you've got the oxygen problem as well? Well, we were aware quite early on in the experiment that the fish were in trouble. Uh, here are some data from the uh, uh, sort of first summer. Uh, these are the oxygen saturations in the unheated and in the heated tanks, and I've just shown the uh, uh, high-nutrient tanks here. Uh, the histograms show the uh, biomass of the fish in the four replicates of the, those treatments, and you'll see that the uh, biomass is much lower in the heated tanks uh, than in the uh, unheated tanks. By the end of the experiment, when we harvested the fish, we found the following. We found that heating always reduced the biomass or the numbers of fish, but heating plus even the lowest level of added nutrients uh, here made the fish extinct. Uh, and both of the nutrient levels uh, where you have heating and nutrients, nothing survived. There were just total wipeout of the fish. In other words, extinction during these uh, circumstances. And if I just remind you again of the position of sticklebacks within the British and also the Dutch uh, fish fauna, then here are sticklebacks. If something nasty happens to sticklebacks, and indeed it did, then something even nastier uh, and earlier happens to all of these other species. And we're left just essentially with three tolerant species, the tench, the crucian carp, uh, and the carp in the UK, uh, that are likely to be more tolerant than sticklebacks. So, our temperature's rising, our nutrients are rising, uh, we've got various effects. Uh, what are the consequences now of these effects? Well, I've illustrated here what can happen here. Uh, species can either uh, die or they might phenotypically adjust and survive. Uh, they might become uh, extinct or they may change by evolution 
and uh, Luc de Maestri will doubtless tell you bits about that this afternoon, or they might move and they might be replaced by invaders from elsewhere. So my third stanza in this poem is, but in will come the migrants uh, from lands of warmer hue, exotic plants and animals make everywhere a zoo. And we're starting to see that. In Lake Windermere uh, in the United Kingdom, data here of Ian Winfield from the Center of Ecology and Hydrology, uh, the Windermere had a eutrophication problem which has been brought under control. Phosphorus levels have been brought down, but the temperature has been steadily rising. As a result, the Arctic char has gone into decline in the lake. Pike have uh, increased slightly, but particularly predominantly uh, roach, which are an introduced fish from southern England, not native to this part of the, uh, the British Isles, have increased very markedly and are starting to take over from the Arctic char. So we're starting to see this invasion. We're seeing it also uh, in other species. Uh, here are uh, British uh, damselflies and dragonflies and southern species. Remember, this is a basically tropical group. The ranges have been shifting northwards, uh, particularly of the southern species uh, in the last 20 or 30 years or so. But even the northern ones are moving northwards too. But there's a major invasion northwards of the southern species. And then back to fish, we're particularly worried about invaders like the common carp, which is introduced, which is a very damaging fish, but which is very popular as an angling fish in the United Kingdom, particularly by competitive young male anglers, because it fights on the line and it grows very big. And so you catch your very big, putt, big carp and you're photographed with it, and that's a measure of the size of your penis. And then you put it back in the English fishing system and next year you catch it again and your penis has grown even bigger even though you've got older and that's very rewarding for young men. But it's not very rewarding for aquatic ecosystems because this is a very damaging fish indeed as you well know it bulldozes the bottom. So just to sum up these effects so far of heating and uh, nutrients, it, it's, well it seems to me I found this uh, this uh, book in my daughter's collection of children's books from a long time ago. It's about a small boy called Robert who was coming home from school one day and suddenly found himself to being followed by a hippopotamus. And then over the next few days, that hippopotamus, uh, with all of these nutrients around, uh, this invading hippopotamus with all these nutrients around, suddenly became many hippopotami. And that seemed to, to sum up... Um, what, what is happening with this combination of eutrophication and warming. Invaders that will grow and come to dominate uh, our systems. So that brought me to the final and most important uh, verse of this poem. Uh, While millions die in Africa and the med lakes turn to brine, the rich will come with loaded gun to shoot hippos in the Rhine. Now, don't think the hippos will ever get to the Rhine, though, of course, they were here in the interglacial period. They won't get here for various uh, human reasons. But it's symbolic, actually, of how we treat the problem. Uh, our attitude to environmental problems is governed by the fact that we see human socioeconomic systems as the most important. And the planet, the environment, is a sort of subsidiary separate system in the way it's seen, uh, and we take things from it, the big black arrow, uh, but we don't actually do a great deal to repair the damage or replace what we take. And you can see that attitude in almost every utterance uh, of every person who is not uh, an environmental scientist. Uh, Milton Friedman, economics Nobel Prize winner, said, uh, so the question is, do corporate executives, provided they stay within the law, have responsibilities in their business activities other than to make as much money for their stockholders as possible? And my answer to that is, no, they do not. A totally irresponsible, we give this man a Nobel Prize, for a totally irresponsible view. Uh, an ecologist will say, this is the model that really you have to start thinking about and working towards, in which the human socioeconomic systems are reduced very markedly in impact, in impact before they irreversibly damage the systems that determine the conditions for the biosphere on the planet. Well, nowhere is this uh, better illustrated than the way we're approaching uh, the problem of climate change. Uh, you talk to most people in government, civil servants and so forth, and they will give you the story, oh yeah, we, we accept uh, that uh, more carbon dioxide has gone into the atmosphere, 
Uh, that's increased the amount in the atmosphere. That's resulted in the rise in temperature. All we need to do is cut the emissions and the temperature will go down. And of course, there are very great difficulties in cutting those emissions. Um, we need to, in fact, cut our emissions to keep our temperatures to below 2 degrees. We need to cut our current emissions to about 10% of the current level by doing things like changing our buildings, our insulation, our use of private cars, uh, our, air, uh, our use of air transport. Uh, this, I found this very nice poster uh, for an official sponsor of the uh, uh, UN Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen as BMW, which produce cars that do 11 miles per gallon. Um, I hope none of you came here in a BMW. I'm sure you didn't. But the problem is that reducing the emissions is not enough. Because what you have to do is to reduce your emissions, this red curve here, until the emissions are below the rate of carbon sinkage, the tying up of carbon in things like the organic matter in wetlands, in the calcium carbonate in the sea. And you can reduce those, those emissions as much as you like. But until the rate of emission drops below the rate of sinkage, then the temperature will continue to rise. It's more slowly, but will continue to rise. And so what that means is we not only have to cut emissions, we also have to look after the sinks. And the sinks are the world's natural ecosystems. They're not the agricultural ecosystems. They, by and large, are carbon sources. The sinks are the natural systems. But the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2004 showed very clearly that we've lost about 50% uh, of the, uh, by, by, by 1950, we'd lost about 50% uh, of the systems. By 2050, uh, we expect to have lost about 70% of most of the systems. So we're actually eroding the carbon sources. And as Martin mentioned, as there are lots of producing data on now, as we warm, uh, there is an increased loss of carbon dioxide, even from the, the sinks that we have. Not only that, but the ocean sink is probably dropping too. As the pH falls in the ocean uh, because of the uh, partial pressure of the carbon dioxide building up, then the ability of the oceans to precipitate carbon is dropping. And at the moment, about half of the carbon put into the atmosphere is taken up by the oceans. So the loss of the sinks is a very, very important thing, but which is not widely realized, I think, by the people developing policy for these things. What we need to do is to look after and rebuild those sinks. Uh, we need to convert uh, a landscape, as in the UK, as in the Netherlands, uh, which is largely intensive agriculture, with a few little postage stamps of natural systems, into that sort of system where we rebuild the carbon sink. You're starting to do that in the Netherlands uh, with your uh, e ecosystem network. Uh, you're starting to do it with places like the Oostvaardersplassen, where you're trying to rebuild whole systems. But it's not enough. What we're going to have to do, I think, on, in the Western world in particular, is to rebuild ecosystems. And to do that, we will have to take large amounts of land out of agriculture to restore them to semi-natural systems. And that means we have to manage on less food produced, but since we waste about 85% of the food produced, then there are strong possibilities of doing that. We need to find new ways of building cities that make them more attractive to live in so that we can recreate more natural habitat elsewhere. So finally, what we need is reconciliation ecology, reconciliation between these human systems and these natural systems. We mustn't fall into the trap uh, of my final poem by W.H. Auden uh, in 1947, who said, we would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the moment and let our illusions die. And our big illusion at the moment, ladies and gentlemen, is that we can fix this with our current political and economic systems with a growth economy. That is the primrose path to cloud cuckoo land. Thank you. Thank you.